So in the previous lesson, what we did was talk about sections 28 and sections 29 of the Land Registration Act. This lesson is going to talk about the arguably one of the most important elements of registered estates, specifically looking at the idea of registering interests. And these are ideas that relate to interests which override a registrable disposition. And this refers to Schedule 3 of the 2002 Land Registration Act. We're going to talk about it in a bit more detail in this lesson and in the next lesson as well, because in the next lesson there are actually a few cases that we can finally explore uh, and we're not just relying so heavily on statutes. So the previous lesson talked about the concept of priority as it relates to registered title, talking about, like I said, the general rule in section 28, uh, which is that the uh, when there is a registrable disposition, like, for example, the conveyance of property, uh, there is no effect on priority. And then this is, of course, uh, with the major exception of any of the rules that exist in sections 29 and 30. We focus most of our attention on section 29. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the concept of overriding interests, which are interests which uh, may still bind a purchaser in a registrable conveyance, but that do not represent or aren't represented, should I say, by the land register. They're not actually on the land register. And sometimes these are critiqued as something known as a crack in the mirror. The reason why we do this is because one of the major principles of the land register, if you think back to some of the earlier lessons, is this idea that they uh, that the land register reflects reality. This is known as the mirror principle. But overriding interests technically don't reflect reality because they are not on the register, but they are still nevertheless interests which are required to be registered or, or at least required to be bound by uh, or to a, a, a new purchaser in a disposition. So they are seen as something of a crack in said mirror. We'll explain what they are and how they work according to Schedule 3 of the 2002 Land Registration Act. So let's just think about that. What is an overriding interest? Well, an overriding interest is a third party interest, just like some of the interests that we see in Sections 29. But they are in a third party interest which a purchaser of registered title will be bound to uphold, uh, despite not knowing about the interest and also despite the fact that they do not show up on the land register. So they are a particularly strong um, uh, protected interest uh, that, a, that a third party can have over a piece of land. Because not only um, are, are they not known by the uh, purchaser often, um, but they're not needed to be registered on the land register. They can be overriding in that way. Given that they are interests which overrides the basic mirror principle, um, they are the highest form of protection that you can give and you can grant to a third party interest in registered title. So... These are outlined in Schedule 3 of the Land Registration Act of 2002, um, and it outlines the remaining legal interests which will override a registrable disposition, i.e. overriding interests. And what we'll do is spend the majority of our time looking at one example, um, uh, uh, looking at, at one of the examples um, here in, the, uh, in Schedule 3, we could spend a lot of time going through every single example, but just like with the idea of conveyance being our sort of case study for dispositions, we will take one of the Schedule 3 interests as a sort of case study for actually um, how we apply Schedule 3 and therefore how we apply overriding interests. Don't forget, when you are thinking about this in, in the form of a problem question and you're thinking about potentially whether or not an interest will bind a purchaser in a problem question, you will have to go through the various different stages of the process looking at registered title. So you would have to look firstly at whether or not the uh, title or the interest, should I say, is, is legal um, or personal, uh, uh, i.e. Uh, proprietary, sorry, uh, proprietary or, or personal, i.e. a right in rem or a right in personam. You then think about whether or not that interest can be uh, overreached and then you may go down the list and go to sections 29, section 30 and see whether or not it is protected by the Land Registration Act there. And then if it is not, you will then go and have a look at whether or not it is an overriding interest in Schedule 3. And this is really where we're at in terms of the general flowchart from point to point in relation to uh, understanding whether or not an interest will bind a purchaser. 
We will also only talk about one major element of the Schedule 3 provision because the others are, are either of less important or because they will be discussed in a future lesson. So you will see uh, some of the key words that you will find in future lessons time um, being part of the uh, overriding interests. These interests include local land charges, easements and, uh, and profits a, a, a preneur. Uh, and also leaseholder states in land, interests of persons in actual, actual occupation. So um, we'll talk about leaseholds, we'll talk about leases in future lessons, we'll also talk about easements in future lessons time. What we're going to examine in this lesson and in the next lesson is the concept of the interests of persons in actual occupation. How does this work? How does the case law interpret this particular provision? And how is this applied in real life? So Schedule 3 of the Land Registration Act says the following. It says that in relation to interests of persons in actual occupation, an interest belonging at the time of the disposition to a person in actual occupation, so far as relating to land of which he is in actual occupation, uh, except for an interest under a settlement under the Settled Land Act of 1935, an interest of a person whom inquiry was made before the disposition and who failed to disclose the right when he could reasonably have been expected to do so. An interest which belongs to a person whose occupation would not have been obvious on a reasonably careful inspection of the land at the time of the disposition and of which the person to whom the disposition is made does not have actual knowledge at the time, etc, etc, etc. This is a little bit complicated, a little bit wordy in terms of the language. We will start to unpack this in the next lesson in far more detail, so, so don't worry about that. But as a general summary, what does actual occupation tell us as a part of this idea of it being an overriding interest? Well, upon examination of paragraph 2 of Schedule 3, which is where this um, actually is, paragraph 2 as you can see here st uh, stated, we can see that in order for actual occupation to amount to an overriding interest, there must be a priority right, which exists, in conjunction with the actual occupation, and that this must be minus inquiry into the property. So, you will have to first have a right which has priority, okay, whether or not it is registered or not, and then this right must exist in conjunction with the actual occupation, a person who is actually occupying the property. And then this must be without the person who is doing the uh, purchasing actually doing a proper inquiry into said property. Uh, if all of these things are satisfied, then actual occupation may amount to an overriding interest under Schedule 3 and therefore may bind a purchaser of registered estate. There's extensive case law on this matter, and we'll talk about uh, how the case law interprets all of these different things. So, for example, what actual occupation means, how is this applied, depending on the different types of land that we're talking about, all of which we'll explore in the next lesson.